Okay, shall I kick off, Nick? Sure. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to one of the final sessions at the, the Aikens annual meeting. Um, and this is going to be a roundtable discussion on the UN on uh, Global Compacts, um, really looking at Nick McKinsky's book, um, UN Global Compacts, Governing Migrants and Refugees. Um, so welcome. And with this roundtable brings together migration and human rights scholars to discuss the, the book, um, which analyzes the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, the Global Compact on Refugees, and the Global Compact for Migration, all negotiated and adopted by UN member states between 2016 and 2018. McKinsky argues that the declaration and compacts were significant achievements in global governance because they put migration and displacement on the global agenda, and because they introduced new framings of, of, um, of migration related concepts and established the architecture for future global migration governance. He, um, McKinsky in his book reflects on three broader shifts in global governance that we also see play out in the global compacts. A shift from hard law to soft law, from rights to aid, and from Cold War politics to nationalism. The book is based on three years of fieldwork that Nick undertook um, and legal analysis, as well as interviews with diplomats and senior UN and EU officials. So the way we're gonna structure this round table um, is we hope to make it quite an informal discussion. Um, I'll um, first hand over to Nick, who's going to introduce the key findings in his book for around seven to eight minutes. And then we'll go around um, to hear from each, each of the participants, hearing their reactions to the book, um, as well as the, the global compacts in general, given their specific areas of um, expertise. So Nick, I'll hand it over to you, thanks. And actually, before I hand it over, I'm gonna quickly introduce the panelists that we have. Um, we have Dr. Danielle uh, Zach from the City College of New York. We have Dr. Zanetta Garabegovic, from the University of Salzburg. We have Mr. Andre Sebastian Becerra-Rayas from City University of New York. And we have Dr. Ra Rowan Ara from the University of Washington and Dr. Mari McCullough from the International Organization for Migration. So welcome everyone. And Nick, now I will hand over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I wanna, uh, first off, thank you to Akuns and all of the panelists as well. This is a really special opportunity for me to reflect on. I've been thinking a lot about the global compacts. Um, uh, I wrote some of this during the COVID years, so it, it's been nice to actually engage with people talking about some of the, the findings. Um, so I'm gonna do two things very briefly here at the beginning. First, to just tell you why I wrote the book, and second, what I think the biggest findings are. So, this book came out of several years of field work, like um, Celia just mentioned. Um, I followed the negotiations of the complex very closely, attended many of the meetings and consultations. Throughout, I spoke with activists and uh, policymakers, diplomats, UN officials. And at the time, I was in Greece and Italy researching the government and the EU's response to large flows of refugees. And while there's an important story to tell there about how the EU responded, everyone was speaking about um, and quite eager to talk about the global compacts. Particularly, everyone had different ideas about what it should do, what was realistic, and what the impact could be. Many were pessimistic, of course, but others were quite excited to see migration at such a high level on the international agenda. So the reason I wrote the book um, was because after the compacts were signed, nobody actually knew what was in them. Uh, many of the people I talked to were like, well, we know that there was some controversy about this, but what is some of the detail of it? Right? So first and foremost, the book analyzes what is and what is not in the compacts, what's missing, and tells the story of how we got both of those documents, sort of the politics behind why something is included and other things aren't. In addition, I lay out clearly what each document says um, and what, uh, what I think their impact will be on global governance more uh, generally. The book attempts to place these compacts then within a wider politics of international migration. I start with some of the basics, um, basic concepts. Actually, what, what I uh, wanted to know about migration uh, about 10 years ago when I started studying this, um, and some of the more recent history of migration within global institutions. I identify five sort of fundamental challenges to the global governance of migration. And those are the lack of capacity, the lack of responsibility sharing, the lack of access to protection, the lack of citizenship, 
and the lack of coordination. And those challenges were fundamental to the negotiations for the compact, but were also very difficult to address considering the current political context. Overall, as Cecilia mentioned, my main finding is based on sort of these three broader shifts. And I talk about this in the introduction, try to trace it throughout the book, that there's a, a wider shift happening in global governance of states preferring soft law over hard law. And there are implications for what we can do with that. We also see a shift away from rights towards aid, and especially aid for vulnerable migrants and rights for refugees. And last, the idea that the refugee regime was forged during Cold War politics and sort of the politics behind that established many of the rights and norms that we have today. And that the politics of today, those closer towards nationalism really shift the landscape of what could be negotiated during that time. Because of these shifts, the compacts only address one of the five challenges that I mentioned before, namely coordination. I'm really excited to discuss this idea with um, the other panelists. This was really a fun book for me to write, partly because I hope to use it over the next few years to teach um, and keep thinking about it with my students and what they need to know. Um, but also in the conclusion, I think more broadly about what kind of fundamental forms are actually necessary to address those five challenges that I started with. So I'm gonna leave it there. I know it's a little shorter than I mentioned, but I'm really excited to hear others' reflections and talk about in more detail, sort of get into some of the politics of the global compacts. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Um, so we'll start off, I'll um, turn to you, uh, Danielle. Um, if you can provide us your general reaction uh, to the book, Nick was very keen to, to get your reactions um, to the book. But also if you can reflect on the soft law nature of the compacts um, and this fine line between being quite broad and in terms of what they encompass um, and the soft law nature of, of the compacts. Um, and um, also if you could also reflect on the shift in focus from rights to aid that, that Nick refers to. Thanks. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you all. I'm, I'm just so delighted to be on this panel. It is a real privilege and pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon, New York time. And congratulations, Nick. This is a real superb accomplishment. This book is very rich, very detailed, very comprehensive, and very critical in its analysis of the compacts. I also very much appreciate your intersectional approach especially bringing in gender and gender identity and sexuality, which often get excluded from these conversations. And again, I think it is a wonderful contribution and the ways in which you point out the gaps in these compacts, particularly around LGBTQ plus rights. So I, I wanna say, I thought this book was extremely informative and very thought provoking, Nick. Uh, I think you're very cautiously optimistic about the contributions of these compacts and the, of what they make to global governance. And I, I get a sense that you wrestle with trying to be optimistic because your critical analysis is very sharp and it's very powerful. And I think um, sometimes makes it difficult to feel optimistic about what these compacts have produced. Um, so I just wanna say that I think you persuasively find that the compacts have cultivated attention to challenges of contemporary migration. I think they've provided a forum for discussion and helped to build architecture for future interaction. The development of coordination mechanisms, not my specialty in thinking about uh, the UN activity, I'll leave that for the other panelists to, to comment on further, but that they also uh, cultivated inclusive dialogue, including civil society, uh, and also promoted one of what the UN's best uh, attributes is, is to promote research, data gathering and sharing. But I, I think I'm more pessimistic on the potential of these compacts to provide the foundation to build new norms and to bolster existing ones that enhance the protection of refugees and migrants. And in some ways, you keenly note that they actually undermine international hard law. But perhaps more concerning is the ways in which the compacts actually bolster competing norms and practices, uh, Sovereign prerogatives in the areas of border control, detention, surveillance, and deportation are particularly concerning, and the ways in which these undermine and outright violate the rights of many individual migrants in the world today. At the same time, as you keenly note, there is the shift from rights protection to aid, and that you know you very nicely tease that out in these chapters. 
Uh, we see certainly the emphasis on aid, whether of a humanitarian or developmental nature, uh, and really kind of, again, uh, rights kind of uh, being relegated to the sidelines. Not only are they are there seem seemingly weak affirmations of rights, but again, as you mentioned, there are ways in which uh, they're outright undermined in, in the language that's used in these compacts. I appreciate your discussion of the potential of soft law to contribute to norm development, enhancement, and, and expansion. And as constructivist IR scholarship reminds us, ideas and norms matter, right? Naming and shaming is the mechanism that you highlight as being central to soft law and the reputational costs that sometimes come along with um, bad behavior. But even if we, we lack enforcement mechanisms and states violate rights around the world, they do take them seriously in the international arena for their reputation. And you highlight this important mechanism. I think about China most recently, just in the past day or two, its, it's behavior in the Human Rights Council uh, when being called to task by Canada and, and companion countries to, uh, you know, for more interrogation into its treatment in Uyghur Muslims. Uh, China then turned around and said, well, what about your colonial legacy? And what about the ways in which Western countries violate the rights of refugees and migrants, right? And that it is, that it is being used in, as a political football as better than it not being used at all, quite frankly. Um, the compacts uh, that you mentioned are, are certainly a reflection, as you say, of a shift away from, soft, from hard law to soft law. They are politically expedient. Um, the, the way to get maximum buy-in with minimal opposition. And at least we get states around the table and have the, have the potential to generate innovative findings and potentially affirm rights, uh, which may bolster shaming in the international arena. But I think the reality is that the affirmations in these compacts uh, are overshadowed by a concern with practical matters of aid coordination, getting more aid, whether again of a de of humanitarian or developmental nature, and actually giving more emphasis and weight to counter norms, the norms of sovereignty uh, and practices that actually are abusing, leading to these massive human rights abuses that we see uh, at the US southern border or in the periphery of Europe. Um, really just, uh, again, uh, giving legitimacy to these practices and, and promoting them, essentially. I think on the one hand, uh, you know, these what seem what you call potentially new emerging norms maybe seem to me more like catchphrases at this point. Uh, responsibility sharing, a repackaged term for cooperation, uh, state responsibility to manage safe, orderly, and regular migration. But the substance seems to be lacking, and there's no filling or no measures. And so they're kind of just these phrases, I think, that may be difficult to gain traction if there really is no substance around them. And of course, what substance does get attached to them will certainly be shaped by the kind of politics that you so nicely uh, highlight in terms of the rise of nationalism, xenophobia, and racism. So again, um, you know, on the one hand, as you mentioned, the North tasks the Global South with warehousing refugees, gives them aid to prevent them from crossing into their borders. You house, we pay. I mean, this is essentially what contemporary burden sharing, you know, entails, as you highlight, that it will develop into something more is really, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm pessimistic, I'm pessimistic. Um, and, and I'm going to say my pessimism is rooted in, you know, that this is not just a short term political context. I think the kinds of politics that we're seeing in the world today, the rise of nationalism and xenophobia are endemic linked to globalization, the, the winners and losers of globalization, that this backlash is going to be for, for quite some time uh, in a context of growing inequality. Uh, and of course, a carbon fueled capitalist system that will generate further climate displacement. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention the climate displacement in a moment because I, I appreciate and I think that is one of the contributions that actually comes out of the compact for migration is to actually recognize it. Um, but just to, again, be clear, I think these two, you know, uh, ideas are still, I mean, uh, again, just seem to be catchphrases more than anything at this point. Um, 
I will, you know, I, how am I on time, Celia, Cecilia, because I do have a lot of detailed comments on both the, the compact on refugees and the compact on migration, and I don't want to hog time, and I have a tendency to do that because I get really excited when I'm talking about this material. <laughs> so, so let's, let's, if it's okay with you, or if you want to wrap up in another, say, 20, 30 seconds. Yes. And then okay. we'll come back to you for sure, though. Okay. All right. Yeah. That sounds Thanks. good. And I just want to say, I think, again, what, what these compacts most fundamentally reinforce are absolute sovereignty and neoliberal norms and practices uh, at the expense of human rights. Um, and I think, yes, we might get some better coordination of aid from the UN. I think that would be a boon uh, and perhaps a mitigation of the turf wars that Nick nicely discusses. But whether or not this is the beginnings of some, some greater uh, shift in global governance on migration, I think is not so optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. I'm gonna turn straight to, we've got a lot, lot to feed into the discussion um, for later, but I'll turn straight now to um, Zanetta. Um, if you as well can provide your general reactions, but also reflecting from your work on um, diasporas. What role is there for the diaspora communities in the, the Global Compact for Migration? And if you could also reflect on the reforms that Nick proposes in his concluding chapter um, in terms of looking at the bigger picture of global migration governance. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll try to stay within my time limits. Um, but thank you, first of all, for having me part of this, uh, be part of this book panel today. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and, and sort of hearing the different perspectives. And I'm equally excited about about um, being part of this panel and the conversation, of course, would prefer to have it face to face, but here we are. Um, I think uh, while reading the book, um, you know, one of the courses I teach at the University of Salzburg is this MA course that it really explores the intersection of policy and research in migration. And throughout reading the book, I kept sort of finding sections and chapters that could very well be integrated into the syllabus the next time I teach it. And it's something I wanted to highlight and was very happy that Nick has also sort of written it with keeping that in mind, because I think this is one of the one of the real sort of challenges of this kind of scholarship and 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 also one of the challenges of, of teaching migration related topics. Um, I think what Nick has really accomplished here is to find that balance between sort of understanding and critical engagement with of the global compact, um, considering sort of the importance of balancing the variety of agendas right among the variety of actors that are included in, in this, you know, lovely mess that, that we call migration scholarship, migration, global governance. Um, and in that regard, I'd like to congratulate him on this book and the contribution he has made to the literature more broadly. And I echo here Danielle's comments and, and just, just want to sort of say that I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book. And I'll be sort of brief in my comments today to address some of the, um, let's say, remaining construction sites that Nick speaks to in terms of the future and ultimately the move from this norm setting to the norm settling, right, of, of the global governance of, of migration through the global um, in the conclusion, he provides potential solutions for four major problems that he addresses that he also outlined earlier um, in this panel, namely the lack of capacity, responsibility sharing, access to protection, and lack of citizenship with sort of concrete policy solutions. And I'll focus my reflections here today um, a little bit on those from this angle of a diaspora and migration scholar, um, but also a scholar who focuses a lot on work um, on post war states in terms of emigration. And of course, um, I'm happy to continue the discussion later on, but also um, we'll try to sort of expand a bit on some of Nick's suggestions. And I think this is one of the, the, the strengths of this book as well, the fact that it really encourages and opens up multiple avenues for scholarship on the compacts, incorporating intersectional critical approaches to migration scholarship and, and policy. I think this is um, this is a real, real success. Um, and here, the potential of the global compact is sort of more reform in terms of this capacity and responsibility sharing, if we're going to call it that, right, comes to the forefront um, in terms of opening potential channels for engagement of state institutions with diaspora actors um, that that encourage more serious engagement on multiple levels, right, through international organizations with other states, um, which I think of course, ends up ultimately also building trust um, that diaspora actors might not necessarily have 
collaborating simply with their home countries otherwise, right? And we've seen some of this work already in terms of migration and development, where diasporas are already explicitly considered within the compacts and will surely continue to be linked. Um, but also, you know, considering sort of learning mechanisms from best practices, and I think that's sort of um, the, the, the future in this regard. Nick speaks to refugee quotas as being one of the ways um, of reform to address responsibility sharing obviously fully noting the challenges behind this that we've you know seen play out in Europe over the last few years but I think it also speaks to sort of larger ideas that I've been thinking about namely that states can't simply consider themselves in terms of simply immigration or immigration exclusively anymore which they they like to do in rhetoric right but in terms of more comprehensive ways and I think the global compact have that I, I I'm going to try to be more optimistic here um this potential to, to speak to this directly and the scholarship can sort of push that agenda a little bit forward um I see this you know more concretely in terms of say Bosnia and, and Herzegovina one of the countries that I've study because there you know the current migration crisis happening on the border of individuals being stuck right on the border um, is really where it comes to the forefront and that the EU incentivizes collaboration you know um, for you know through financial support by waving you know the eternal carrot of a potential EU membership for border externalization practices while EU countries refuse to share responsibility or take in migrants or, or even refugees. And I think here what Nick addresses in terms of, um, you know, subcontracting capacity and decisions to sort of um, share the burden with, with UNHCR or the IOM, for example, I would sort of say that we can move beyond that and empower um, state and local institutions to help implement policies, right, um, to encourage more buy-in, um, but also support for the same. I think it um, provides this opportunity for them to take a more active role in, in implementing policies and, and sort of having that buy-in, demonstrating that, you know, our understanding and experience of migration and mobility can look different, can be more sustainable, can be more fruitful, right, for both sending and receiving countries. Um, it can be more of, um, could we I dare to say, an enriching experience rather than sort of a variety of sacrifices, challenges, desperate measures, you know, last minute solutions. And I think Nick's appeal to share this responsibility really opens up this debate about potential solutions that are, you know, ultimately more sustainable and safer, especially for migrants in precarious situations. Um, those stuck in states that simply, you know, don't have necessarily have the capacity to address migration challenges with, you know, the recognition, obviously, of the challenges which he highlights throughout the book and, and that Danielle has also outlined, especially in terms of, of the rhetoric that, part, that certain state actors have. Um, and this, of course, all speaks to the importance of better data and continued collaboration between academia and policymakers, political elites, international organizations, um, better conditions for those who have migrated and sustainable options for those who potentially want to return, and here I mean diaspora. Um, and so in terms of Nick's sort of um, policy solutions or reform uh, options of considering new citizenship solutions, I would also encourage us to think a bit more broadly and consider diaspora return also more concretely as well. In other terms, thinking of, you know, more long term lenses, particularly for conflict generated diaspora populations that go beyond just the sort of migration and development lens. And I think COVID here has opened up lots of opportunities and we'll see this play out in conversations um, about borders, citizenship and labor policies in years to come moving beyond you know what what we consider in terms of citizenship um, today um, in general um, I have more to say but I think I'll, I'll sort of bring my comments here to a close and very much look forward to um, the rest of this exchange and just want to congratulate Nick once again on bringing this group of scholars together today um, to discuss what you know is a very dynamic topic um, but also in, in terms of migration scholarship, but also sort of, I think one of the most policy relevant topics in the world um, today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Senator. I'm gonna turn straight away. We're really sure, um, we've got a tight schedule. So straight over to Andres, if you can um, reflect as well on your reactions to, to Nick's book, um, but also put that in the context of the Latin American region, um, which, you know, your area of specialization. So more broadly, looking at the Global Compact for Migration within the context of the Latin American region and reflecting on the challenges and reforms that Nick proposes um, in the context of the challenges um, that, that are pertinent in the Latin American region. Thanks. 
Thank, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I have to say, and, and coincided with <clears throat> people who've spoken before me, that Nick Masinski has written a very important and timely book. And I want to underline that this book is written in the best style available to academics, and one that we often don't actually end up using, but he has, in that it is clear, well-structured, and to the point. And um, I think we can only really write um, simply about issues that we know a lot about. And in this case, it is clear that Mazinski knows a lot, I mean, you know, truly knows what he's writing about. And in this lucid writing, Mazinski manages to pack in quite a lot. Um, the argumentative arch is coherent and sound, and the reader is never baffled by the components of the text. So I want to congratulate you on that. And it's, it, it, it'll therefore be a really important and kind of useful text for academics and practitioners, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll focus on, on some of the challenges that Misinski identifies and the solutions and, and bring in some, some aspects of how this plays out in Latin America. So Mazinski singles out five challenges uh, for, for global governance of migration. That is lack of capacity, lack of responsibility sharing, lack of access to protection, lack of citizenship, and lack of coordination. And I think that these challenges correctly identify some of the, 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 the good ways of, of lumping together <clears throat> some of the more challenging aspects of, of migration governance. Um, from the point of view of Latin America, of the Latin American region, I would like to so, sort of unfold, so to speak, what these challenges might mean um, to identify what might otherwise go missing. So for example, when we speak of the lack of capacity by state, the lack of state capacity as a challenge for migration, it's not, I think we, we, we should go beyond just thinking of the lack of capacity to process asylum applications, for example, and go into what is damaging actively migrant rights. So in the case of Latin America, low capacity states mix with big issues such as organized crime that are currently affecting migrants. Um, in Mexico, sadly, there are, for instance, three large massacres that are that stain the country's most recent history. And they're the main the the the, the main the, the largest proportion of victims of these three massacres were Central American migrants. And that's the massacre of Cadereyta, San Fernando, and the most recent one in 2020 in Camargo in, in just a few, a few miles south of the Texas border. So lack of capacity um, is a huge, huge issue in Latin America, right? So I think Nick is spot on when he argues that the lack of capacity is a huge issue for, for, my, for migration. As states that were traditional states of emigration become states of transit, such as Mexico, but also states of destination, such as Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, the lack of capacity and the lack of citizenship becomes not only, becomes you know, a very relevant issue. And Latin America is currently at this sort of migratory crossroads. So the big countries in Latin America, such as Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, are now countries that are not easily classified as only countries of emigration. There are all these things mixed together. And they have big issues in terms of, <clears throat> of what sort of services that their, their state can deliver and their, the incapacity to monopolize the use of violence within their territory. And that is affecting migrants directly, right? Um, the lack of citizenship, which prima facie seems like an issue that is kind of exclusive of the global north, is also now an issue of the global south. And we see this in places like Mexico, where MPP, so-called Migrant Protection Protocol, um, whereby a lot of uh, where, whereby asylum claims were processed um, in the United States, but people had to wait in Mexico. So Central Americans were mostly Central Americans were waiting in Mexico. Um, will soon become an issue of lack of citizenship because what happens to the the, the Central Central American and other uh, nationalities who claim asylum in the United States but don't get it? And are waiting in Mexico. Does Mexico have the legal um, infrastructure to absorb that, to absorb people who are also kind of credibly not willing and probably um, it's not safe for them to return to their home countries for numerous reasons, among which, you know, is gang violence or other forms of violence. Um, in Colombia, uh, the, the large number of Venezuelan uh, migrants who 
you know, entered the country very recently, also posed the question of lack of citizenship in a country that was not used to debating and to understanding what the lack of citizenship might mean for a large massive population within their territory. And they've come up with ad hoc solutions such as the PEP, the, the, the um, status for uh, temporary permanence within the country. When the time frame uh, winds up in Colombia, what will the government do to the more than 1.7 million immigrants of Venezuelan origin who are there? Um, so these are really important challenges. I think Masinski has, you know, really zoomed in onto and given us a language to understand challenges that are very broad and that affect um, set multiple dimensions of migration. Will the compacts be successful at addressing these challenges? I think that that's a big question that you know raises that raises further questions around successful for whom? Is it successful to preserve the international regime that? favors sovereignty over other um, international norms, right? Um, successful for what? Is it successful when it comes to guaranteeing rights or not? La Latin America, again, I think will be a, prov will provide really interesting cases to understand whether or not the compacts will be successful. And I think one of the important parts of the compacts that Nizinski talks about is um, the, the preservation and dissemination of best practices when it comes to, to migration. So. I think again, the, the Venezuelan so-called migration crisis, I, I don't like the, the notion of crisis always being involved in large influxes of migration, but will South American countries adopt the language and the um, practices of the compacts to then gather and, and kind of make sense of the best practices when it came to the Venezuelan um, migration uh, of recent years? I think that this will be a good kind of test as to whether or not the compacts are actually being successful, if their language and their institutions are being adopted or not, or if maybe Latin America will prefer to go for more regional um, international organizations. Uh, th that'll be kind of like a good test of that. Um, I think my time's already up. I have more to talk about, but I'll, I'll stop here. Um, thank thank you. you again for the invitation. Thank you, Andres. And we will definitely come back to you and we'll talk about implementation in one of the follow-up questions um, as well. So that's it. Um, I'll turn now to Rowan, if you could also provide your reactions, but also reflect on the, I guess it's, it's particularly chapter three, which focuses on the, the negotiation process. And, and if you can reflect on some of the north-south tensions around the global compacts, um, Nick refers, you know, in our discussions, we were talking about the grand compromise, the so-called grand com compromise. Um, and if you can also talk, reflect on the role and involvement of humanitarian actors in implementation of the compacts, and we'll get further into implementation um, in a moment, but if you could already get us started on that, looking at the role of humanitarian actors. Thanks. Thank you. Cecilia, will you remind me how much time? <laughs> how, yeah, how it's loosely three to four minutes, but uh, yeah, <laughs> right, I'm, not, I'm not counting yeah, with Thank a you. stopwatch, so go for, your, go for it. Thank you for that. And, um, Thank you, Nick, for the invitation to read your book and, and to be on this panel. It's already been so um, informative and interesting to hear everybody else's takes. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to sharing my ideas and also having this larger conversation both in this form, but hopefully you know, we'll all continue to talk about this. Um, I want to reiterate how clear the writing was, and uh, I can't wait, especially to teach that first chapter um, in a, a class on refugee issues or, or migration issues or even humanitarianism and a study of the UN. Um, I was, I immediately uh, messaged Nick after reading that chapter and, and told him, you know, after working on refugee issues since 2009, I feel like it took me years to try to piece together this taxonomy and how, um, how everything works, especially coming uh, from a background as a sociologist who's not necessarily steeped in the IR literature and, and just trying to unpack what's happening on the ground. So this would have been, especially that intro chapter would have been very helpful for me as somebody um, who, who was going into the field. Um, I suppose I should tell you a little bit about um, my background information so you, you know kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I, I, most of my field work has been in Jordan and I've mostly worked with Syrian refugees, although I've also worked with Palestinian, Iraqi and Sudanese refugees um, and I have done ethnography and in-depth interviews and I'm a sociologist. So um, 
I want to start with kind of two overarching frameworks that shape much of the conversation on refugees and migrants um, within the social sciences. So the first, which I'm sure everyone's very familiar with and which comes up a lot in the book is just thinking about what is the dynamic between refugees and migrants? What's up with this dichotomy? Who does it serve? Yada, yada. We all know this debate. I think one thing that the book does really well is go beyond kind of that first conversation where we identify that sociologically in terms of people's lived experiences, it doesn't necessarily fit into the convention definition, what's missing, um, and, and seeing how states engage um, with the parameters of these debates is very clear uh, in the book. And so I think for somebody who's interested in pushing that conversation further, the book is also um, is really helpful in that way. Although I, I don't think that you're uh, necessarily engaging with that trajectory um, of scholarship, I think that this book really helps us think through how um, the parameters of these categories are negotiated and what they serve. Um, I then, I, I want to, you know, we've talked about how um, states, the UN, international organizations are knowledge producers when it comes to refugee issues. And I think one thing that um, I also got from this book is it's helping me think through how to navigate um, the relationship between what things are called versus what is actually happening and and the ways in which um, Nick is parsing out these debates, I think, helps us think about, you know, for example, when we're talking about responsibility or burden sharing, what exactly does that mean? Who is invested in that language and, and what comes from that? I think this is really significant because if social scientists who are not necessarily steeped in the actual policy making or the on the ground implementation of what's happening take some of these words at face value, we will end up essentially being misguided because of the ways that things are talked about are not necessarily what's happening on the ground. Um, and so maybe that's number two. And then the last kind of overarching point that I was interested to bring up is oftentimes as a guiding frame, we divide the world into global north and global south. And in terms of going through these compacts and these negotiations, even in terms of um, Obama and uh, the New York Declaration, I think that something that you're offering, Nick, even though, again, it's not necessarily explicit, is showing different kinds of coalitions among states and how that in and of itself may shape the ways in which we talk about interests and, and the interests of states. So uh, a clean global north, global south divide operates in a certain way. It helps us do some things. But I, I really think that identifying um, who is interested in forward or in pushing forward certain agendas, specifically in terms of which states? I, I think you do a good job of that. And I think that that will lead scholars to think uh, more critically about how they categorize state interests on the, the global level. Um, now, I think those are some three overarching um, frameworks that I believe we can start with in terms of thinking about the theoretical significance of um, these compacts and, and these negotiations. I was also really interested in thinking about, um, because Nick so clearly describes what is said, of course there are these sections about what's missing, but I, I think there's also um, something that we can discuss, which is what is what is not said, or, or in terms of when things are clearly laid out, what remains on the margins of those, and how I, I think as people who are doing work on the ground, we can think about um, what that is. I was, let me give you an example, right? I'm really, really interested in these complementary pathways and in terms of resettlement, complementary pathways to resettlement. So we have the three durable solutions that work in the following ways. We all know the pros and cons uh, and, and what doesn't fit into uh, these three categories. I'm so intrigued by the complementary pathways because I feel like it's a catch-all that can fit. Um, and in some ways it, it, it leaves room it's very ambiguous, right? But also we see some room for um, 
intervention, let's say, that, that isn't necessarily laid out. And we see that in terms of, I, I think you mentioned in here too, that humanitarian visas and even um, work visas being tied to those who are affected by climate displacement. Right, so kind of leaving that on the margins, I thought was particularly interesting. Um, another thing I was hoping to hear you talk about, Nick, is if you can draw a thread across, um, essentially just bringing together all of the, the times that you mentioned, the detention of children as kind of this um, uh, topic that becomes really controversial and, and that's when sovereignty gets claimed. Um, I think that's particularly interesting because at least in the media, it, it's not like the detention of children is something new, but we are hearing more and more and more about the US and Australia. Um, and I think the ways in which I, I, I'd be interested to hear what you think in how the ways in which um, the US and Australia have detained children ha has essentially shaped the sovereignty conversation about this issue. Um, Rowan, I might ask you to wrap up with your next point, and then we can come back to you if that's okay. Um, okay, I'll just, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll make one quick point or one quick question for Nick to think about. Um, in terms of the thesis about soft law, I was interested in thinking about the role of time and soft law. Do you think that the fact that states had to take advantage of the situation in which the, the global community was paying attention to refugees and migrants now, it, the fact that it is such, it was such a, uh, let's say a change for what was happening for, for years. Do you think that time plays a role in that? And how can we theorize time within the context of, of what we're reading? And to conclude, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed reading this book and I learned so much and I'm looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rowan, and we will come back to you. Um, Nick, after, I, I, after we turn to Marie, I'm gonna turn back to you to already engage and, and respond to some of the, the points that have been raised. So just to, to alert you of that. Um, so Marie, now over to you, um, if you can pro provide your general reflections and, and um, Nick had mentioned you know, a preparatory discussion that he'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the actual negotiation um, process, which is what he focuses on in chapter three of, of, in his book. Um, given that you're you know, really involved in the, in the process um, as well. But also if you can, can give a quick recap on the role that scholars and, and researchers um, played um, in the, the development of the Global Compacts, but also what role now, um, how are they being engaged now? Is the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, for example, still alive and kicking and, and engaged in the implementation process as well as the monitoring review and, and follow-up process? Um, thank you, over to you. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, like Rowan, I think it probably makes a bit of sense um, to preface my comments with my background, uh, it, because it's a probably a more unusual background, I find, is I've um, worked in migration as a practitioner, as a senior official, um, as an academic researcher, and have found myself at IOM heading up the Migration Research Division and the, uh, um, the Chief Editor of the World Migration Report. So I've had the privilege of uh, seeing this from so many different angles, including through the high level dialogues on migration and development in 2006 and 2013 and being at the, as a, as a member state for the um, Government of Australia, doing interventions at, at various meetings um, in Geneva and in uh, New York and then have had um, the privilege of, of doing doctoral research on Hazaras out of West Asia to Australia. Um, so looking at self-agency of REFCON refugees uh, with a finally determined grant rate of between 96 and 100% over five program years. So genuine refugees, but looking at their migration patterns and processes. And then being in IOM, I landed in IOM uh, two weeks before IOM went into the United Nations system. I had previously worked at the ILO in my first career and uh, ended up back in the UN. And so initially uh, was just quite focused on ensuring that, you know, the biggest brains around the world could contribute to the development of the Global Compact on Migration. Um, so worked with colleagues internally uh, to really 
think about and consult on how that could be done in a highly projectized um, uh, way. So a very efficient way, a highly effective way, a way that involved diversity, diversity in terms of disciplinary diversity, geographic diversity, most importantly, gender diversity and so forth. So we actually set up the syndicate that um, Cecilia mentioned. And uh, so in that sort of context, I think the book, um, I think it's a timely book. It's, the story is not over though. So this is at a sort of a particular point in time and it provides a useful overview of the compacts. Um, but I'm certainly happy to share with Nick some more materials. We've written two chapters, Susan Martin, Professor Susan Martin from from uh, Georgetown University wrote uh, a chapter uh, in the 2018 World Migration Report on global governance um, and including in relation to the lead up to the global compact processes. And of course, Kathleen Newland worked with us um, on an update chapter uh, after the global compacts had been finalized. So more than happy to, to share those because it wasn't just the GCR and the GCM that were going on, there was a whole, separate stream of work in regards to the UN reform system under the Secretary General and Kathleen Newland worked on that um, consultancy and did that work. So in that context, the particular role um, that I was involved with, very privileged to have been um, involved in, was in relation to the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate set up uh, specifically to inform the development of uh, the Global Compact on Safe Orderly Regular Migration. We had 36 scholars from around the world. I flipped it slightly. So we had policy makers who were advisors to the syndicate rather than the other way around. It's usually the other way around. But we had former senior officials involved in kind of basically acid testing uh, technical papers that were very much focused on implementation, taking knowledge, decades of knowledge from around the world, in particular um, thematic and disciplinary areas, and translating that into top three reads for policymakers, uh, short technical papers, um, side events uh, during uh, the intergovernmental negotiation phase um, at the beginning of 2018 to mid 2018. Uh, involvement in as special rapporteurs, but also as experts on panels during the um, informal consultation phase prior to Porta Viata in the stock taking sort of sessions. And we also engaged with the co-facilitators in Mexico and, and Switzerland in terms of presenting and briefing them on the uh, contents. And we can see in terms of the final, uh, certainly the zero draft, I would say more than the final text, um, but the zero draft uh, certainly did reflect a lot of the content that was put forward uh, by our syndicate members, again, heralding from, from uh, 36, uh, you know, very serious and senior scholars from around the world working and had worked on migration over many decades. Um, I should mention too, it's two weeks uh, today of the passing of Ambassador William Lacey Swing. Um, we've all been incredibly saddened by Bill's passing and Bill was instrumental along with others such as Peter Sutherland and also Bunky Moon, of course, being SG at the time, to have, uh, you know, really brought together states in a way that I think many did not think was possible. I mean, I'd been attending many, um, you know, high-level dialogues and many um, large meetings, UNHCR and IOM, uh, as, a, as a member state and was so used to hearing interventions. It would be certain governments getting up and making their points, but it was the first time that states actually sat down and negotiated over text on such a critical issue uh, in the wake of the 2015-16 um, flows uh, to and through Europe. Uh, so it was, I think it's difficult in a kind of a COVID and we're all pretty tired because of COVID and it's the last session in the, in the annual meeting and so forth. It's very, and we're also virtual and we're zoomed out. It's really difficult to recall, I think the enthusiasm and the energy that was around at the time. It wasn't just states and it wasn't just the UN who were seeing this as a massive opportunity at the time in the wake of, of the, the uh, large scale movements. It was scholars 
It was um, practitioners, it was NGOs, it was migrants rights groups, it was refugees themselves, most definitely. Uh, there was an energy and a sense of a uh, rare historical opportunity that needed to be seized in order for that to be taken forward, in order for a framework that hadn't been able to be progressed previously because migration and displacement have always been, always been geopolitical. I mean, just recall the work of Charles Keeley, the late Charles Keeley, for example, recall Susan Martin's you know, ongoing work. It's always been highly geopolitical. We just have to look at UNHCR and UNWA, for example, because we had just have to look at 1947 and partition. But to overcome that, it took many people, uh, including Bill, including the late Peter Sutherland, including Ban Ki-moon, including a whole range of people behind the scenes to be able to realise that, to set up a framework that the glass is not always half empty. Sometimes it can be half full. There's a lot more work to do. We just have to look at those hot spots around the world. You know, we just have to look, you know, I'm in Europe, I'm in Switzerland. I don't have to look very far to see that there are serious human rights abuses ongoing. There are, there always have been, and they are sometimes they can be very profound. Um, and it is up to states and it is up to the Security Council and the, you know, the, the machinations and the mechanisms that are in place to call states to account. I think you know, states fully understand that. They may disagree, but that is the basis of the UN system. It's the base of, basis of international cooperation. It's the basis of regional processes, but it's also still the basis of what we're calling soft law, but others call mini multilateralism. So here we're talking about the Nansen initiative. We're talking about the migrants in countries in crisis initiative, recognizing 2011 and Libya and how that imploded and states coming together, uh, led by certain states. And, you know, we will just say that uh, certain states are back at the table, so to speak, and are leading in certain uh, geographic areas very strongly. So there is an opportunity. Of course, there's a lot more work to do. And I think it would be a little naive to expect that we will, we will ever get there. It, it is an ongoing project. It is something that uh, human rights activists all, all the way around the world, including in Australia, um, know that you, it's never going to end. So to go have a mindset that things will shift and change in radical ways. We have to keep at it, basically. It's an, it's an ongoing project. And it's in the context, too, of hardening um, national uh, situations and a, and a really strong push towards nationalism. We saw that after the negotiations and before the um, compact was adopted, and... There are different dimensions uh, to this, and certainly I've worked with scholars on this particular topic, and we actually have a, a chapter coming up in the next World Migration Report on the use of technology and disinformation. Because it wasn't necessarily that the substantive issues had changed, the substantive issues had remained largely the same, but the role of particular tribal groups who are operating transnationally and who've been able to utilise tech platforms to actively undermine the global compact processes after it was signed but before had political um, fallout, as Nick has mentioned in Chapter 3, in terms of states' willingness to come forward to be part of the process. However, we also know too that it might not necessarily be binding in terms of being a, a legal document that is um, binding under international law. It is politically binding and we will see and we have seen and we are continuing to see shifts in terms of uh, it being binding in a political sense, in a geopolitical sense and also in a domestic political sense. So, I, I mean, I look forward to the discussion. I do think... Um, the way in which, and my particular area and my particular kind of focus in terms of bridging the policy research divide is particularly important. The work of the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, as Cecilia mentioned, it was specifically to inform the Global Compact on Migration. So the 2017 syndicate is no longer um, in place. We have a high level um, group that advises on research and publishing because one of the big things that I can see is that publishing is 
tremendously changing and it's impacting uh, policy processes as well as um, the scholarly environment uh, too. So we do work uh, with a larger group actually of um, uh, researchers from all around the world on current topics, but we're also supporting the UN Migration Network and its um, knowledge platform and connection hub of which they have done multiple calls uh, requesting uh, not just academic uh, researchers, but also practitioners to lend their services to things like peer review, to the production of outputs to inform states as they implement um, the global compact, as well as non-state actors. And that's one very significant shift uh, that we have seen, which is tied up, and, and uh, Susan Martin talks about this in her chapter on global governance, that we have seen very tremendous shifts in regards to state authority over time um, in, in the last hundred years, especially where non-state actors are having much greater say in terms of agency and the delivery of various services, um, sometimes positive, sometimes not so positive as well, but they're having a much greater role in regards to how societies operate, how migration is undertaken, the impacts on migrants, but also the impacts on states as well. And so in the context of uh, so-called mini multilateralism, the global compact process, but also the implementation of the compact under the network, there is a much greater role for civil society, for the private sector, um, for a whole range of different partners. And I think this is a much more complex environment, say than 1951. Thanks. Thanks, Marie. Uh, Nick, I'm going to hand straight over to you to already respond and engage um, with some of the points that have been raised. I also just want to take this moment um, for people um, in the audience uh, who are participating. You already, if you would like to write any questions that you might have for Nick or any of the other the people on, on the, in the roundtable discussion, if you can pop those in the chat and we can incorporate them um, in the responses as we go back around um, now through the next round. And um, you can also raise your hand if you want to unmute and and say your question. So Nick, over to you. And then in the meantime, if anybody would like to raise questions, please do so. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you again to all of the panelists. Um, this is so great to engage on the topics. You've all brought up really substantive like debates and things that like you can only include so much in a, in a, a short book like this. So I would have loved to keep going and going and going, but um, I hope it hit the right um, level and depth of engagement in, in many parts. I want to start off first with Marie's um, a uh, discussion about mini lateralism. And I think this is definitely something I tried to lay out in the second chapter about the history of global governance building up to the compacts is it, it built on this long history of smaller uh, forums, the global forum on uh, migration and development, the high level panels, the uh, uh, global migration group, um, and even within the sustainable development goals, these things all led to the eventual uh, negotiations for the global compact. And I think it would be really remiss of us to ignore that as the basis of where the compact started. I mean, there's a lot that came from that to begin with. Um, and what I think, I think just to Danielle's point, the reason I'm optimistic is that the compacts lay out an architecture for engagement in the future. It's not like the compacts happen and we're never coming back to it. We have forums that are happening every four years, every state's coming together for this. There are regional forums, there are networks that are set up around the world, and these spaces for engagement on global governance of migration were not there before and now are regularly in action and interacting with people. So if I'm optimistic, it's because we have the spaces now to engage in it. The work isn't done yet. This is 30, 40, 50, who knows how many more years to come, but we have spaces that are going to force the discussion to happen, not just wait for the next migration crisis to happen and then have the optimism. We have the spaces. Um, so I think that's where I, I wanted to, um, to, to start with. The second, um, I, I'm going to start, I'm going to go reverse order. Rowan, I loved your three comments. I'm going to, uh, three frameworks. I'm going to engage with those, I think, for years to come because there's such interesting ways of thinking about the, the global compacts. 
Um, let's start though with the, the complementary pathways, because this is a really interesting framing that UNHCR and others had sort of been playing with beforehand, but it really became headline news through the global compact that this is their way of like expanding uh, protection, complementary pathways. And it hits Danielle's point of what does it actually mean? Everything and nothing? In some ways it does, right? I mean, th th there's everything thrown in there, uh, academic scholarships, uh, the humanitarian visas, all of those things are part of it. The key part I think I wanted to emphasize in the book is that they are not supposed to substitute for the three durable solutions. And we don't necessarily know what that really means now, because I think countries are very interested in temporary protection, very interested in these sort of complementary pathways and not interested in durable solutions, keyword being durable, right? What does it mean if the UN is sort of lowering the bar of protection that it could be just temporary or could be the sort of um, uh, hard to, to nail down uh, things? I also say that um, uh, Ban Ki-moon was instrumental in sort of putting these things on the agenda, has set the, the goal of resettling 10% of the refugee population um, as like a negotiation point. States balked at it and didn't even go near that, but it is important to note that these individuals set that as part of the discussion. I think that changed the, the course of the negotiations because of that. That was a very high bar and it pushed states to, to, to really move on that area. Um, if we look um, at Andre's points, I really loved your example from Mexico and how a state that was an emigration state has moved to transit and, 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 um, and now receiving or destination state, how it now has to think about its own state capacity and citizenship. Uh, I think what I drew out of this is that these migrants who maybe are gonna be rejected from the um, MMP, um, migration, uh, MPP, um, what do they do after this? They are, I think what we would call vulnerable migrants, right? They didn't get asylum status, but they still have some vulnerabilities that they can't be deported and sent home. So the global compact sort of addresses this in that they start talking about the things that need to be done for migrant, vulnerable migrants, but none of those are rights-based, right? Those are all best practices and aid-based. And that is when, um, this is the way that the new framings around, um, and it's not a norm yet, it's very not a norm yet, but vulnerable migrants is a, is a, is a new category that we're thinking about what policies do we give to them? And, or, or, or do states owe vulnerable migrants? And that is totally up in flux and is definitely not rights-based. So I, I, I think that is super important and super interesting to see that um, as you see in many of the, the member states when they were like either signing or deciding not to sign, they very clearly stated like, we are not expanding refugee protections to vulnerable migrants. Don't misinterpret us. Um, and we don't know necessarily where it's going to lead in the future. I'm optimistic that we will be able to push states to use non refoulement maybe through court cases, maybe through other sorts of protections, but non refoulement is this very important human rights category that doesn't just apply to refugees, but can be more broadly applied to vulnerable migrants and needs to be seen as that. Um, uh, Let's see, Jenita, I love the way in which you incorporated diaspora into citizenship and not to think as a just binary that your citizenship is in one state and the other. I think this is something I didn't include in the book and would love to think more deeply with you in the future. This is really interesting as like a, a space for the future, dual citizenship even, right? How does this impact relationship to states in, in many ways? I really, really love that. Um, and that, in the negotiation process, I guess um, this is something that the global compacts in general were trying to tout was that it's not it was negotiated primarily by states, but there were spaces for non state actors and UN agencies and academics, as Marie pointed out, to engage um, very substantively in the process. I think diaspora, maybe for the first time, were engaging in this real multilateral institutions in a real substantive way. And we see that through uh, diaspora having major sections of the global compact um, uh, dedicated to them. The question now is, what does it lead to? There's a lot of promise, but where does it lead afterwards? Um, and hopefully it does. Um, let's see. Um, again, I, I am super interested in the ways in which uh, the, the compacts play around with new and emerging norms. 
Again, I am very hesitant in the text to say these are not norms yet. We're the, if anything, it's the first step on a norm life cycle. And I'd love to know more of what the other panelists think. If is that too much? Have I claimed too much here? Is it not even a first step? Maybe it's a, it's a step before even then. Maybe they're considering going on this step. But things like the state responsibility for safe migration, right? This isn't necessarily about um, a right to migration. It's not that but it's that states need to make it safe. And that many states were uh, up for uh, agreeing to. Um, now, actually putting into practice at the US border right now, it's not safe, right? The uh, Mediterranean is not safe. What does it mean when we sign up for things, but don't actually implement them? Uh, it can be very disappointing. Um, I'll leave it there. I have more, I think we can engage on other things, but I'd love to hear others' thoughts and maybe um, respond a bit more. Thanks, uh, Nick. I can't see um, so far any questions in the chats um, or any hands raised from among the participants. So what I'll do is I'm going to um, I'll, I'll read out a couple of the other points that that we discussed in our preparatory discussion, um, including this um, you know emergence of this so-called norm on on safe, orderly, and regular migration. And then I'll hand back um, to each of the panelists just to give it'll be a minute and a half, two minutes. Um, you know, in the time that we have left, and then hand over to you, Nick, um, to, to wrap up. So uh, in, if, if people can offer their reflections on, on what Nick was just referring to with, um, with the safe, orderly and regular migration and, and um, that the idea of, of a potential norm emerging out of that and, and how it actually can come to be given we're so far from it at the moment. Um, some of the other questions that, that we talked about um, were, and it was raised by one of the panelists already, what's missing in the global compacts? Um, another one was um, in terms of implementation and in terms of some of the recent um, events, like the follow-up actions um, at the UN, political shifts after the 2020 US election, um, increasing attention and pressure at the U US borders. Um, how does the books analysis stand within those contexts, but also co context, but also the global compacts um, themselves? So I'll, I'll, they're the general questions open for discussion. I'll let you pick and choose. Obviously, we won't be able to cover each of them. Um, but I'll go uh, to you first, Danielle, if you would like to, to jump in on any of those. I think my concern or my skepticism around this emerging norm of uh, safe migration is that it it's uh, confined to regular migration and the most unsafe forms of migration are irregular migration, which is completely sidelined and actually uh, reinforces discrimination against uh, irregular migrants. And so, again, I, I just wonder how far that can advance given embedded within the migration compact, um, uh, you know, is, the, is this discriminatory stance toward irregular migrants? And again, I don't. I think that their vulnerability is not simply a lack of political will. Right? Um, it is purposeful. And I just think about what's happening in Mexico, and that we have these migrant mass graves. That is part of a conscientious, pol conscious policy choice on the part of the United States to make irregular migration extremely dangerous and deadly. In addition to the ways in which, again that um, the, the situation that irregular migrants find themselves as being you know, extremely vulnerable to kidnapping and extortion and various human rights abuses that are not only perpetrated by gangs, but also perpetrated by government officials themselves, right? And so there is an explicit policy as a deterrence to migration to make, to make it extremely dangerous, vulnerable, and deadly. Thanks, Danielle. And it also raises the question of who has access to regular safe and orderly migration and who is excluded from that. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Zanetta. Thank you. Um, I'll sort of just touch on this, this question of safe, um, orderly and regular migration and, and sort of echo some of some of Danielle's concerns, though I, I generally do do think that um, you know, I, I would sort of respond to Nick's comments in terms of this, this question of norms as as the compacts attempting to set norms, right? If we think of agenda setting as norm setting, I, I sort of see it in that way. 
Um, and when we think about sort of safe and orderly and regular migration, the sort of rhetoric to also really be critical in terms of this whole conversation about migration management and in particular here the things that I that I sort of worry that that make my sort of all kinds of red lights go on is when we talk about migration only in terms of you know documented um, you know ways of, of border control policies of linking securitization of migration right the securitization of migration and managing migration through you know walls the militarization of borders maritime interception development initiatives, detention, deportation, um, and, and, you know, assisted return, um, and to really think about it more, and, and I think here is where the potential of the compact become, become obvious, that there is, you know, this domestic coin that, that ultimately, um, you know, is open through the, through the compact by encouraging transnational governance structures that incorporate different migration processes within and among um, and between states that can potentially move beyond the securitization of migration. Um, and really thinking about it in terms of, you know, incorporating the role, you know, of human rights related questions, right? Of, of thinking about, you know, some of the reasons why initially individuals might want to migrate, right? Beyond this sort of, you know, um, you know, just 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 ad hoc solutions and, and sort of last minute decisions and oh my God, there's individuals stuck in one place or another and, and we need to sort of um, think about them. And this is what I tried to sort of um, highlight in, in, in my comments by, by calling them, you know, construction sites that remain. Um, because I do think this is this is a much broader conversation that will continue, you know, in, in for, for decades to come. And, and here I, I really sort of echo um, some of the, the, the thoughts that that um, Marie had. Um, yeah, I think I think I'm I don't want to keep on talking. I know there's more of us to speak, so I'll, I'll stop here. But thank you. Thank you. And I can see one participant has um, his hand raised. If you want to say the question and that way the remaining people responding can, can possibly respond as well. Fama, do you want to ask your question? Sure, th uh, thank you, Cecilia. Um, Nicholas, I haven't, I haven't read the book. I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I look forward to it. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation around it and really understanding the tenets of um, what was presented. But I, I, I was also um, struck by the, by, by the terms raised in this conversation around mini multilateralism and um, regular and ir irregular migration. Um, and, and I understand the compact does have its champion countries. There are about four or five of them that are, uh, I understand not only benefiting from resources uh, from the agencies of the, the migration network, uh, but also um, advocating for the issues. Um, and other concepts of failed migration as well, and you know, how does that kind of weave into um, uh, irregular migration or, or, or into the, the overall dynamic and safeguarding their rights. Um, and also the International Migration Review Forum, I think, which is almost connected to the VNR and the SDG Voluntary National Reviews. Is that something also that could be used as, um, um, uh, how should I say, an incentive for governments to out and, and demonstrate what they're doing, not only the five um, voluntary ones, but but others to show that they are kind of taking steps forward, particularly the signatories of, of the compact. So I know we have the compact, it gives us the vectors, um, it, it's it's ambitious um, and, and it's forward looking, but there, there's kind of those nodes going forward to continue the, the momentum and, and, and you know, um, amplify and elevate the, um, you know, the principles of it. Over. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, Andres, I'll turn straight um, back to you, um, if you could give your uh, thoughts in, in one minute. Thanks. Sure. I'm, I mean, we were talking about safe, orderly, and regular migration. And again, the case of Mexico uh, strikes a chord. The current president campaigned on this issue and promised safe, orderly, and regular migration. And Mexico was, you know, kind of champions uh, mi migrants' rights internationally and champions kind of a multilateral approach to migration, obviously because it's a country of historical migration. And once in power, the president did a mostly about face when it came to this. And so, again, we need to understand, and I think part of the answer 
comes from a lack of international pressure, actually, and a lack of international sanctions or not formal sanctions, of course, but you know, even kind of a reprimand internationally because of his about face. It's also about a lack of a domestic constituency in countries that conceive of themselves traditionally as countries of emigration to kind of care for and, and, and make it a political issue how migrants are treated um, if within the country, right? So again, this is a, a kind of an interest. I, I just want to say, you know, this is a kind of a good test of, of what's going on. Um, uh, Latin America is generally, I think, at the moment, one of the one of the most interesting regions to understand what's going on with, with migration. And just very quickly talk about um, some of the solutions proposed in the book. I, I think that they're really bold and, and interesting. And they're they're really there to kind of like, I think, create debate and kind of show you that the solutions that are being suggested for the kind of key challenges in international migration governance have not been all have, have you know they range widely and some of them are very very creative um and i think that that's also kind of the strength of the book that uh, it's included it's also included like potential solutions to to what seem like intractable problems so another kind of hurrah for for the text Thanks, Andres. Rawan, over to you. You know, after a, um, a lecture or in class, students always ask, OK, so what's the solution? So, OK, you've shared all these problems. And um, I find myself, you know, when Marie said, let's look at the glasses half full as opposed to half empty, I too was like, OK, so we're doing this. We're looking for, for half full. Um, and and for me, uh, another point in which this resonated, my, my ears perked up when Nick said the life cycle of a norm. And immediately I thought to myself, okay, let's let's draft it, let's let's write it out. What is the life cycle of a norm? And how um, do the changes that have happened in the last few years maybe shape that conversation? Um, and I don't have an answer to that, but I do want to, to make a point that I think will be really important is that I think, you know, in, in the book, Nick, you talked about um, this shift towards development, migration and development. And there was a really pithy line in there that wasn't, you, you said something like, um, it wasn't about development that would benefit the migrants, but it was about development that would benefit the states. And I think that this is um, going to be a really important issue that we pay that we should pay attention to. And one thing I want to mark about this issue is that I don't think it is just in the favor of uh, southern states that will contribute to containment that would ultimately support some kind of uh, safe and orderly migration, but that in fact I think development is a kind of deterrence that is going to be a part of this feedback loop. And I, I just wonder in this um, sketching out of the life cycle of a norm, if as we you know maybe end this conversation thinking about that, um, what role does feedback play into this and what kind of feedback mechanisms will happen after the negotiations, which also I think speaks to something that Marie had brought up that we're just getting started in a way. Um, and I wonder how much of this is, um, you know, uh, how much of our conversation is path dependent based upon our analyses of things that have happened in the past and what new trajectories have you introduced us to in these conversations and, and I want to say that one of those new trajectories is this focus on development. I'm really interested and curious to see what happens through there. And then my final point that I just want to bring in and is, you know, <laughs> sounds maybe like a, um, a, a wildly off base is we haven't talked about the, the rights of citizens in the global south and the role that the rights of citizens also plays in this larger conversation. And I think that overlaps with a conversation about development. Um, maybe the next frontier is to think about that in relationship to the rights of migrants and refugees um, and, and moving away from just referring to people who live in the global south as members of the host community, but recognizing that their rights are also involved in this larger conversation, which I think goes back to what, what we were talking about earlier in terms of Latin America and, and specific, specifically in Mexico. Thanks. Thank you, Rowan. Mari, your turn. Well, there's so much I could say, but I've, I've only got a minute, haven't I? So I'm going to show a slide instead. Um, I did put something in the chat, and I think Samad's point is um, is spot on. There's, there's intense competition between states about showcasing 
I don't know how many presentations I've done to global compact migration events, you know, regional, sub-regional, country level ones and so forth. There's, there is very strong appetite and there's some very interesting work going on um, that is being implemented by states with partners, including with um, researchers, with international organisations, with NGOs and so forth and so on. But I'm not going to talk about that. I am going to show you one in the context of Rowan's comment about development and having been um, a migration nerd for such a long time. Uh, this, I think this um, slide is quite useful in putting a lot of things into perspective. It's from a different presentation, but it is on international remittances. And on the left is the World Bank's projections of international remittances in the context of COVID made in April 2020. They were predicting a 20% decline in international remittances. I would just highlight foreign direct investment you can see along the top. Official development assistance is the dotted line along the bottom there. International remittances have outstripped ODA for such a long time. And they now actually have overtaken in the context of COVID uh, foreign direct investment. The annual decline was supposed to be, they projected around 20. In October, they revised that to seven as the IMF data came in, which showed from mid 2020, some record levels uh, posted by central banks around the world. In actual fact, when the final numbers came in, a brief that was only released in May, last month, the end of May, 2% uh, decline. Migration and development, that's where the high level dialogues kind of really took us on a course including through the leadership of Peter Sutherland and, and, and Bill Swing and others. And they have ended up with, um, on the right, this is the projection going through to 2022. But what we can see for 2020 is actually just a slight dip because migrants historically will always remit in times of crisis where they are able to. We have much greater maturity of big key migration corridors around the world, including obviously the biggest corridor historically is the US and Mexico. But we're also seeing digitalization really changing how migration is undertaken from a whole range of different perspectives. And we had a, an interesting panel on this uh, on Thursday night, including in relation to transfers. So there is obviously you know, a focus on the, in the SDGs in regards to the costs of remittances and bringing them down. That is also reflected in the Global Compact for Migration. We know that um, migration and development um, is a very significant issue. And what we can see through COVID, one of the lessons learned from COVID is that it's going to continue to be a significant issue. It's going to continue to be intertwined with globalization. And if anybody's interested in migration and globalization, I can recommend a fantastic um, uh, handbook uh, edited by Anna Trian Defaladu from Ryerson, which does talk about the various dimensions in regards to governance, regulatory regimes, um, economic issues, gender, a whole range of different aspects, including sub-regional um, dynamics. But migration and development is going to continue to be a very significant issue in terms of contributing to overcoming inequality. It's not necessarily going to be, again, it's like human rights, it's not going to end. I think this is becoming one of the very strong and big apparent issues in regards to how global economies are working, where the kind of power is moving and shifting towards. And it's, it's going to continue to be a governance issue, not only for, um, uh, states in developing countries, but also for states in developed countries as we see power shift more and more towards multilateral um, organisations and in particular sectors such as the tech sector. Let's not talk about cryptocurrency. <laughs> Thanks, Mari. I'm getting a nudge from our um, admin. Nick, over to you for the final word. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I guess my, my first reaction is migration and development is like a hot topic. We see uh, Biden and um, and Harris really emphasizing this as their approach to migration to try and stem the, the root cause of migration. I think we should also continue to be skeptical of this as not the, the catch-all win for everyone. Migration and development shouldn't be shown as um, 
as something that development is going to stop emigration. And that's really what we see Biden and Harris pushing for right now, development that does that, which is not how migration development works, right? It's this complex phenomenon in which people migrate and reinforce development on both sides. And remittances can be both a good thing and have other impacts that we don't necessarily do. They can reinforce inequality amongst uh, migrant and non-migrant communities. They are private resources that shouldn't be captured by governments locally. And we know that remittances actually don't lead to economic growth per se, they lead to um, decreases in household poverty, which is important, especially during COVID, but isn't an answer for, for, um, for development worldwide, right? It has to be more complex than that. And I think the, the Global Compacts did that in a way that was really important. And we have to continue that nuance throughout this entire um, discussion. The last thing I wanna end on is just that um, when we would think about safe, state migration, a safe migration, States um, define that very differently than what migrants, undocumented migrants, human rights um, activists, scholars thought about. States were totally in agreement during the compacts that we're ready to, to increase our state capacity to control and regulate migration, it, affirming their sovereignty, right? And so in many ways, that was the win on the table there. But we also have to then be very skeptical of what, um, what increases in those capacity mean for human rights in the long term. And that's what I hope the global spaces and the, the review forums in the future and our future debates like this will be, is holding countries accountable, um, naming and shaming sometimes, and, and um, championing those that are real success stories as well. Thank you so much for engaging on this, and I really am excited to continue the conversation in other ways. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our admin uh, tech support. Thanks, Nick, for your book. Thank you to all the panelists and thanks to all the participants who hung on uh, to the very last session at the Aikens conference. So have a great rest of the day, wherever you are.